begin by saying this is a joint meeting. It's a joint school committee meeting of the um, four area towns and the Frontier Regional School Committee all together to consider um, recommendations from the administration. Uh, we do have to open each individual meeting, um, each town's individual meeting as well as Frontier. So I will call the Deerfield School Committee meeting to order at 6.32 p.m. Ken, why don't you wait a sec? It's not recording yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, why don't you wait till it? Till <laughs> I, Darius has got that tuned in. Sure. Mm -hmm. You're right, it is spinning in my corner. Yeah. You're going to be okay because it's also live streaming on YouTube. And that is being recorded. Okay. So we are okay. Um, then I will again call the Deerfield School Committee <clears throat> meeting to order at six thirty-two p.m. Bob, you, Bob, you want to do Frontier? Yeah, we. Can, you want to do a roll call while we go into the well, We'll worry about we'll worry about attendees. Let's call the meetings to order, and then she then she can do her roll call. We'll call Frontier Regional to order at six thirty-three. Elaine, are you on? I'm looking quickly. No, she's not here yet. Um, Maureen's there. Greg, Gregory, are you here? Happy to call the Sunderland Elementary School Committee meeting to order. Thank you, Greg. Um, and Maureen? I'm going to call the Waitley Elementary School Committee meeting to order at 6.33. Okay. And... Um, have Phil, we have, have Phil call Conway. They have three people here. I was, right. I was going to say, Phil, did you would you want to call Conway to order, Phil? Call Conway Grammar School Committee meeting to order. Thank you very much, Judy. If you want to do your roll calls before before you do that, Darius, I saw Michael yes. Mirror got bumped off. Did you see that, or is he back on? It bumps people I saw off. Flash. If you don't accept the recording, it bumps you off. All right. Is Michael back on? Not yet. All right. Go ahead, Judy. Okay. I already have Frontier in order. Uh, Conway, I have everybody, ex well, except for Michael, I think we'll bounce back in, hopefully. Um, and is Elaine in? Probably not. Not yet. She was joined. Okay. Yep. I have everybody from Deerfield, Ken, David, Carrie, Mary, and Erica, correct? Uh, from Sunderland, I have Greg. Is Megan on? I'm here. Uh, Jessica, I think I saw. Keith is here. And Peter, I saw also. We're all set there. And Waitley, I'm all set. Okay, good to go. Okay. So we do have a quorum. Um, I would note... For <clears throat> those attending this meeting and um, observing it, that this meeting is being recorded. It is a virtual meeting of the um, five school committees. And uh, we're going to proceed with the agenda. Uh, we will begin with um, public comment. Uh, I will note that um, we received numerous emails that were uh, forwarded to all school committee members over the past week to 10 days. Um, by my count, we received um, about 30 to 35 um, memos and emails uh, <clears throat> uh, expressing opinions and, and thoughts on the uh, proposal that's before the committee tonight. I want to thank all the community members that did uh, provide their input and uh, say that I certainly appreciated having the uh, the material to read and and consider as as we uh, headed into this evening's discussion. So thank you for that. Um, we do have ten people that had requested time to uh, speak in public comment, and uh, I will be reading from a list in in a moment here and call them in order as they were received. I will ask that the um, 
people who are making public comment this evening, please observe our um, policies regarding public comment and try to keep your uh, comments to two minutes. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the, the um, comments should be addressing the matter before the matter that is on the agenda this evening. So thank you. Uh, we'll begin. I have Mel Tolls. Are you on? I haven't had a chance to look. Hello. Yes, hello. Hello. Um, I want to start off by saying thank you and good evening, everyone. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight to my son and many others that feel the way I do. We are all concerned about the health of our children and are excited to see normalcy in our school system. Having the choice of masking will obviously come with some challenges. However, with what we have been through the last two years, these challenges should come fairly simple. We do not envy your, the decision that you guys have to make, and we will support you no matter what. With restrictions being lifted locally, we see more and more children's smiling faces at stores and at restaurants. We've also been watching relatives' children in Connecticut, New York, and New Hampshire with their first day of school photos being posted without a mask. We just hope that we can join them soon. We trust the parents of our children, and we have to believe that they will make the best decision for their child's well-being. I am for families having a choice and can't thank you enough for the tough past two years and for the future of making our school district one of the best around. Thank you very much, Mel and Jonathan Williams. Thank you very much, Mel. <clears throat> Excuse me. Of course, I moved the list enough that I can't read it now. Um, Suzanne Sweeney, are you on? Thank you. Um, so I wanted to talk to you all tonight a little bit about coming from a scientist perspective um, with 27 years in epidemiology. Um, so basically, you know, by forcing kids to wear a mask, we're causing many of them harm, psychological and physical. Parents obviously know what's best for their kids, and they should actually be the gate gatekeeper of their children's health matters. Parents should have a say in the upbringing of their child. So look, what, look what is happening to school boards um, who aren't giving parents choice. Kids are not one size fits all, and your health policy shouldn't be either. So we must provide a solution for these kids so they can receive the education that they have a right to. And uh, one of my colleagues actually down at the University of Florida did a clinical study sending in masks of 11 children um, who had worn masks all day long. And the interesting thing is some of the, uh, what they found was there was 11 dangerous pathogens such as tuberculosis, meningitis, sepsis, uh, bloodstream infections, uh, food poisoning, Lyme disease, diphtheria. Those are just some of the smaller ones that they, they found just from the bacteria of wearing masks with these kids. So. I know that you have based a lot of your decisions on what you all deem as science, but you know, I really wanted to challenge you and ask you about what you really know about the science. Like, do you know the science on a granular level? Like where these studies were published, who the doctors were, what were the participants, what was the endpoints, what was the coefficient gradients? Those are things, if you're making decisions based on science that, that you really should understand on a, on a cellular and a granular level. And when you're thinking about breathing in carbon dioxide, there's been a lot of published studies through the NIH and through the CDC and a lot of different studies that have come out and said exposure to carbon dioxide is very harmful. I don't know. Do, you, do any of you know what the normal uh, rate of carbon dioxide exposure is that's healthy? If you don't, I'll tell you. It's a thousand parts per million. Um, are any of you familiar with what that risk is? increases to after wearing a mask for four hours. That, it goes up by 78%. And what they have found, in the, and you can go ahead, you can go ahead um, and look on the NIH. This was actually published by Dr. Nigel Langford, if you don't know who he is. He is one of the leading infectious disease epidemiologists in, in the country. He's very, very well respected. And he was saying that the top five issues with kids wearing a mask could be asphyxia, blood pressure increases, convulsions, Coma and even death. And this study looked at these kids going out from two hours all the way to eight hours. So, you know, understanding really what what the risks are to these children, 
And if you look, do, do any of you know where COVID deaths land in the state of Massachusetts? S Suzanne, mm -hmm. Suzanne, we have a two minute time limit. You're okay, approaching three good. minutes. So can you please wrap it up? Or yep. So I'm just saying you that, you know, the CDC says that, you know, right now Franklin County is a medium community. Recently, they just removed their guidelines saying that if you're uh, in medium to low risk, that you don't need to have masks in school. So I just want to, that's what I want to say. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your thoughts. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I gotta get to the next name, sorry. Uh, Jillian Andrews. You here, Jillian? I am. Hi, thank you. Okay. Hi. Um, thanks. So thank you. I definitely do not envy you like the previous speakers just said. I'm sure this is a really difficult decision for you. No um, Based on what the CDC says now, and I've just looked it up, um, responding to Suzanne, who just spoke, um, I'm asking that you take the most recent suggestions from the CDC regarding mask mandates. The CDC, and I quote directly from their site, recommends universal indoor masking by all students ages two years and older, staff, teachers, and visitors to K through 12 schools, regardless of vaccination status. At this point in time, mandates are still needed for public health and safety. Wouldn't it be helpful to have a plan in place where we said that, for example, once the rate is X and the vaccination coverage is Y, and when we're able to better ventilate our spaces and spend more time outside, it would be okay to take the mask off. But to arbitrarily pick a date makes absolutely no sense to me. It seems that it is the virus that should dictate what the right date is, not an arbitrary date based on politics. In addition, when the mandates are removed and we are all left with only personal choices, there should be metrics that allow us to say that certain measures are recommended or required for certain groups of people. One certain group of people is those who are immunocompromised. While I feel very strongly that our personal health should be strictly confidential, I am willing to disclose a very personal concern. Last spring, I was diagnosed with an immunocompromised chronic disease. I am currently on autoimmune drugs. These drugs make me even more susceptible to not just catching COVID, but getting seriously sick from it. There are recommendations from my doctors that include things like keep away from people, stay home, have someone else do my grocery runs, avoid close contact, Try not to touch my eyes, nose, and mouth. Wear a face mask when I have to go out. While some of these recommendations are easy to follow and manage, not all of them are possible if I am to continue to teach. I don't have the choice to stay at home, nor do I have the choice to keep away from people, or for that matter, avoid close contact with others, teaching 18 students in a fairly small space. Leaving the teaching profession has not been an option and it still isn't. One recommendation I can follow from all of the above mentioned ones from my doctors is to wear a face mask when I go out, when I go out in school five days a week in my classroom with my students. I continue to hold the high expectations I have for them. I continue to act as their cheerleader. Yep. I have Lunch almost daily with student after student after student who tell me they are overwhelmed by the pandemic, by the fear they carry, by the stress that shows up in their homes. Staying home is not an option for me. Going maskless is not an option for me. Making the right choices for the good of our community is an option for you. Thank you. Thank and you. no offense, but I, as a scientist, I, I gotta I gotta chime in here. I need to no. know. You see, excuse uh, me. Excuse me. Yeah, because you know excuse. I have to work for the CDC, and as a, just a minute, excuse that me, that shared is not correct. I'm just we're not to here it. to interrupt. Please. <clears throat> um, the next speaker would be Jennifer Smith. Hello. Thank you for having this meeting. Thank you for people listening respectfully. We have a lot of voices but we are a community who want the best for our students. I hope that we can all remember that. We want the best for our students. I'm writing to you today, I'm speaking tonight, to ask you to consider not lifting the mask mandate at this time. 
As a fourth grade teacher at Deerfield Elementary School, I work very hard to ensure the emotional and physical safety of my students every single day. We talk at length in my class about how people's safety is a community effort. That people, excuse me, that everyone has to work together to help others feel emotionally and physically safe. That is how we've talked about all illnesses in our classroom, including COVID-19. That's how we talk about masking as a step to ensure not only their individual safety, but the safety of their friends and their teachers. There are students and teachers in my classroom and in our building that need the protection of the wider community. As, an, as the American Academy of Pediatrics still advises universal masking in pre-K to, to grade 12 schools, and I believe that we are a community that should look out for all its members. The level of anxiety and emotional stress that I see in my students this year is incredibly high. The uncertainty in the world, the worries of illness, the constant transitions and changes have left these children frayed and on the edge of their abilities to focus, cope, and learn. As we are trying so hard to catch them up on academic and social emotional levels, please do not add the burden of another worry of who will be masked or not. This is a distraction to them. It will be another pressure on these young people as they are trying to learn and grow. This new amendment made with unclear medical or community data metrics will be yet another job put on teachers to oversee, further hindering our ability, ability to focus on our students' learning and social emotional safety. As a school district that prioritizes equity and inclusion, I'm pleading with you to maintain that priority. It is those who are immunocompromised that need you to stand up and wait on lifting a mask mandate. It is for those preschool children in our building who are unable to be vaccinated who need you to protect them. It is for the students with special needs who need your voice to lift them up so they can have a safe, equitable, and inclusive school environment. Please wait a little longer to lift the mask mandate until other measures can be ensured, warmer weather, major vacations are over, medical and community data can be gathered and analyzed. I appreciate your support of the teachers and of our schools. As one teacher, I need your help in keeping all of our students safe for a little longer. Please don't leave it to us to do alone. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, the next person would be Sean Desmond. Are you on, Sean? Yep, I'm here, thank you. Uh, good thank evening you. and thanks for the opportunity to address the committee and the community. We need to remove the mask mandate for our schools to return a sense of normalcy to our children. I do not feel there is any logical reason not to remove the mandate effective today. Our communities are removing the mandate, schools across the country are removing the mandate, and the science is telling us it is time to put the mask mandate behind us. I was listening to the Frontier School Committee meeting last night and heard the student council present the consensus of the students. They wanna be free from the masks. Many said that they would continue to wear masks even if the mandate was removed. Let's give them the chance to decide for themselves. Our governor stated this week, as he removed the state mandate, that, quote, schools, for the most part, based on a lot of data collected through our test and stay program and other mechanisms, have shown over and over and over again that schools, generally speaking, are not places where there's a lot of COVID that gets transmitted, never has been, unquote. Then why does it make sense that the only place my kids have to wear masks besides health centers is in school? It doesn't make any sense. Our children are intelligent, very observant, and extremely informed. They see what is happening around them, and they understand the hypocrisy of those who make the rules. Many of our nation's elected officials who implemented the mandates don't follow the mandates. What does that tell our children? If masks were that essential, would we see governors, mayors, attorney generals, etc., breaking their own masking rules so regularly? 
In one example, we have the mayor of one of our country's largest cities showing the kids have to wear masks, but he doesn't because he can hold his breath for a long time when around others. And the Super Bowl, which many of the students watch with families, we have the governor of California in a crowd completely ignoring his own mandate. If the masks keep us, kept us safe, wouldn't these rule makers be wearing them? We can't tell our children that masks work when the examples around us show that they aren't necessary anymore. Our children are too smart to be tricked this way. We could be in a stadium with tens of thousands of other people at a sporting event or concert, shoulder to shoulder, without any masking. But as soon as they go back to school in the morning, they need to put it back on. It just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense to me, and it certainly doesn't make any sense to the ones that is affecting the most, the kids in school. The students in this district expect the community to be, to be a positive influence, to us to be, a good, to be good role models, to help guide them. We owe it to them to bring back a sense of normalcy. Any mask mandate that continues after this week is unnecessarily detrimental to our kids. These kids have done everything that they have been asked to do and deserve to be treated with respect and fairness. They just wanna be kids again, kids that can socialize and see each other's faces and emotions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Sean. Um, Amanda Wagan. Hi, thank you. I appreciate all of your consideration and all of the important and difficult decisions that you've made over the course of the past two years to keep our kids safe. I'm right. I'm here to voice my support for keeping the mask mandate in place for now. And I'm hopeful to gain your support as well to keep our kids and the community safe and healthy until we have more data. With case numbers throughout our region higher than they were when remote learning was required, I am asking why is there this urgency now? What was the magic? potion that said this has gone away. There isn't one. There isn't one. It is Omicron is more contagious than any version of COVID that we have seen. And we still have community members, kids in our school, family members of staff and kids in our school who are immunocompromised, kids who can't get vaccinated, where is the magic potion that says they're going to be okay because we're all removing our masks? There isn't one. There isn't a NIOSH certified mask available for children. One-way masking is not adequate for previous speakers' families who are facing the stigma of having to send their kids to school as the only ones masked to protect mom or dad from a severe case. I am hopeful that this community can see past personal views, political views, this is inconvenient, to realize that our kids have adapted so incredibly well and go to school and have a great time, take their masks off outside, see smiling faces, but why not wait until we know the data of all of the towns around us in the stores removing their masks to see what spikes there are. Why will we be the guinea pigs of taking it away right away and seeing spikes in our school? What will that do to attendance? What will that do to staffing shortages if the teachers all get it? And we still have five day mandatory quarantine. I am asking that we take a step back we take a moment to say, let's review what the data says over the next couple of months while the weather is still too cold for windows to be open all the way, for kids to be outside. We have come two years, another two months is a blink of an eye. There is no need to do this right now. I also just wanna say the CDC has us in this moderate level. We are a, a blink away from being in the high level and with masking coming off, we're going to see a spike. And who takes the responsibility in the school to make sure that kids who have to have a mask for their caregivers' well-being 
keeps that mask on? Is that going to be on the teachers or on a five-year-old? We've reached three minutes. Thank you. So I appreciate your consideration. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Allison Booth Mayo. Or did I just uh, repeat? <laughs> nope. <laughs> Hi. Good evening. I usually like to stick to my written comments, but I feel like I want to respond to some of what I've heard tonight. Um, firstly, it's simply incorrect what was stated about CDC guidance previously. The CDC now no longer recommends universal masking for K through 12, except in high risk areas. Um, I note that back in August, a teacher's union representative indicated that teachers were surveyed um, and asked whether they thought the school should follow um, DESE guidelines um, with regard to COVID protocols or CDC guidelines. CDC, CDC guidelines um, being generally understood to be the more stringent ones. The teachers were surveyed. They chose, um, well, a higher percentage of them chose CDC guidelines. And now we're hearing from teachers that this CDC um, guidance is, you know, the, the, the stringentness of, of CDC guidelines is, is not enough. Um, I also feel that we're hearing from people who still claim to be fearful of this. After vaccination, boosting, after two years, the people who are fearful are going to remain so. This is not going away. I also take great issue at the use of citing kids' anxiety to keep masks on. Why do children have anxiety? Because they have been taught to be fearful of something that poses very little risk to them. So please do not use anxiety as a reason for preventing kids to return to a normal life. Let's teach our kids that it's time to stop being fearful. Obviously, just to get to my written comments, obviously I'm here to support the lifting of the district mask mandate. Put simply, it's time. Desi has lifted the statewide mandate. Deerfield, Sunderland, and Conway no longer have town mask mandates. And as I noted, e even the CDC no longer recommends universal masking in schools in communities that do not have, have high transmission. And the CDC is also no longer requiring masks on school buses. When the local mandate was imposed by the school committees and the boards of health back in August, it was in the context of panic over the Delta variant. At again, that time, several- now, Allison, excuse me, but again, we're at three minutes, so I'll give you another 15 seconds, and then I'm going to have to ask you to- Okay, they expressed their intention to support getting the, rid of the mandate as soon as possible. With all relevant federal and state agencies supporting mask optional policies, allowing mask choice is clearly the rational thing to do. Let's move on from this terrible chapter of draconian COVID measures imposed on children, and okay. let- families decide for their own children. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Julie Fallon. Good evening, everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to share publicly the letter that I submitted to you all today. Dear school committee members, I'm writing today to speak to the subject of masking young children in school. I'll begin by sharing that as an essential worker and second grade teacher in this district, now in my 24th year, I contracted COVID-19 in March of 2020, just as schools in our state were shutting down. Because medical care was, according to, the, to CDC guidelines, only available to those with respiratory symptoms, 
Myself and thousands of others across the country were denied medical care and told to stay home, allowing the virus to replicate in our cells for weeks and months, resulting in crippling neurological, cognitive, and other lasting systemic dysfunction. It is with intimate firsthand knowledge of this virus that I urge you to lift the mask mandate in our school. The virus circulating today is nothing like the original more dangerous version from March of 2020. Now, early treatment is available for anyone who needs it and vaccines are widely available. As a second grade teacher, I knew this year would be hugely important for my students, many of whom have gaps in their learning due to pandemic challenges. Myself and my colleagues have the monumental task of trying to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on student learning and close these gaps, which in my experience has been extremely challenging due to the impact masks have on phonemic awareness in our youngest students. There are many children in my class right now who are not able to produce requisite letter, digraph, blend, and other sounds due to mask interference. Without mastery of these foundational skills, students may not make effective progress in reading and writing. And this should not have to be the case. Of additional concern, in my opinion, is the message mask wearing sends to our youngest students. These children have shouldered much of the burden of this pandemic. They've had enough sadness, enough disappointment, and enough of being told to tuck your nose in all day long. What do masks say to our students, especially our youngest learners? Masks send a message to children that they are not safe in this world and that the world is a scary and unsafe place. As this pandemic becomes endemic, isn't it time to send our children the message that they're safe in school? Please unmask our children and allow them the space and the time they deserve to heal from the trauma of the past two years. Thank you for your time, and I appreciate all that you do for us. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, Jill Dickinson. Hi. Um, our kids haven't had a normal school life in two years. Too long years of no school to remote schooling to hybrid schooling and then back in the classroom with overwhelming expectations. Masking, test, testing, social distancing, contact tracing, all of it. It's taken a huge toll on our kids. Not only has their learning been negatively affected, so has their emotional state. Now that the CDC has changed their guidance and is moving towards an endemic Instead of a pandemic, we are long overdue to get these kids back to as close as normal as we can. <clears throat> um, a group that I am a part of compiled a spreadsheet with all the school districts in Massachusetts. And um, there's a total of 272 schools. 192 of those decided to follow a death seat and drop the mandates on the 28th and 39 are doing it, but it's delayed. Um, 23 have decided to keep the mask, and then 18 are undecided. <clears throat> I just, I think it's time to let these kids be kids. Um, they've gone two years, and it's just no more waiting. It's time to get rid of the mask. And I just think you guys should follow Desi and the CDC like you have been the whole time. Um, that's it. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Jill. And we look to the last would be Kim Williams. Are you on, Kim? Hi, everyone. Thanks for hearing me tonight. Uh, I just wanted to lend my support to DESI and the Commonwealth's recommendation to unmask um, students. As an educator myself, I have seen the detriment masks have caused to development especially regarding speech, communication, and social-emotional well-being. Um, here at the preschool, we have seen that in huge numbers. Making masks optional would be a great happy medium to allow everyone to feel comfortable. Those who feel like they still need to wear a mask, who may be in mood compromise, can still have the option. 
As owner of Jaduk, who serves hundreds of families each week, we have just moved to this protocol and it has been great. Some students still choose to wear masks and some students do not, and we respect either way. This is a great way to teach our children about the freedoms of decision and the freedom to respect others' decisions when they don't agree. It's a way to teach our children that some people will not agree with you and that's okay. And we're all making the decision that's best for us. So uh, I'm, I'm hoping, hoping that you'll follow the recommendations laid out by the organizations we've been following this whole time, the CDC, DESE, and the Commonwealth and make mass optional for our students. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you again to the 30 to 35 individuals who also submitted their thoughts and um, comments and opinions via email and, and uh, memos to the school committees. Um, with that being said, we'll close public comment and move on to the agenda at hand. <clears throat> We're here to undertake new business, which is policy EBCFA face coverings. And I'll first turn it over to uh, Darius to outline what's been proposed and, and sent to the committees for consideration this evening. Hey, thank you, Ken. Um, you know, what I, I'll share my screen in a second so that the audience can see the proposal that I put forward. Um, I, I do want to say that you know our district has really, from the mentality of where this proposal is coming from, is we always look at measured responses um, to the pandemic, from our return to in-classroom instruction, um, from part days, you know, from part days, full days to full weeks, um, to going backwards when we had to to shut down, go back from remote education going back to remote education when we were back in person. We did a lot of steps through the years to limiting spectators at sports. Um, we've had to do a lot of adjusting, but we always try to do measured response, and that was my approach here. So I'm going to share my screen here. Um, <clears throat> just to, if this, I'm going to be sharing what the school committee was sent. Can folks see that all right? No. I have it. Can everybody see that? We can see it. Okay. I can't see you anymore. So um, you have to speak up to ask questions. <laughs> so basically what I'm proposing um, is that um, we remove masks on March 14th. Um, the rationale on this, and this was, the, this was, this, uh, was created uh, uh, before the, uh, the break and such. And we, you know, the numbers at the time were, have not dropped as fast as they have this week. Um, we did do pool testing this week. And in our district, we've only had one case this week. So, we're, you know, they're, they're hitting the right direction, but we wanted to see coming out of the break with a lot of travel and such um, to give us some time for cases to settle. So I'm proposing that we remove masks. Now we make masks optional on the 14th. And I want to stress that actually, that we're not removing masks. We're allowing people to have choice around masks. And hearing from the students last night that some students um, will be, and teachers um, and faculty will be um, continuing to wear masks, and we respect that. Um, exceptions to that is that the health offices must still be, must still wear masks in that setting. We will provide masks at that point if students don't have them with them and they want to access the health office. Um, also, in accordance with the DESE and DPH protocols, um, masks must be worn for additional five days unless eating or drinking when students are returning from isolation or quarantine. And um, masks are still recommended for those who are not fully vaccinated or, or immune compromised. Um, we also will continue the fall, following mitigation measures. So we haven't just left COVID behind. Um, this is, we're moving forward with continued pool testing, symptomatic testing, and as you all know, we are doing the eye health home test kits. So we are catching COVID even faster now that folks can um, test at home more regularly. Um, we also are continuing with you know, physical distancing. Um, we still have our ventilation and um, we still encourage people or ask people to stay home um, when they're sick. As far as communication, we, um, we will notify families if there's a cluster in a classroom or student group. Um, even though right now we've gone to the, um, the the online uh, reporting site, we are still contacting families if we if we see clusters to let them know. Um, and um, and the second thing was that we are looking at the um, continue to post the, the numbers on the website. Um, 
At the elementary school, parents request for children to wear masks will be supportive. The K to six teachers will remind students to wear masks. It will notify um, parents that children's consistently declines. We will not be taking disciplinary action for those not wearing masks. Um, I don't want to put this extra burden on teachers. If it's a family request, then we will work with the families to support that, but it, we would not be in a position of disciplining students for not wearing masks. Um, teachers and, and staff members will not require um, will not require students to wear masks. Um, it, it cannot require students to wear masks in their classrooms. So you can't have a classroom-based um, rule different than the schools, just like we don't have classroom-based rules, difference for dress code and other school-wide rules. Um, and then I also added in the policy, should we get a surge in case numbers um, or a, a cluster in a classroom or school um, or a new variant is always a concern um, that I have the, um, the ability after consultation with the nurse manager and the local board of health to impose a, a mask mandate until the next meeting of the school committee um, where the school committee will affirm or remove the masking order. Um, and really the idea behind that is that we'll be able to move quicker without, as you, obviously we've seen the, um, it's very difficult to put on and off these kind of policies, but to have the ability to give the assurance that if we do have surges where we do see a need to um, put masks back on, that um, I'm able to do so um, and such. So basically the new policy would be recommending the new policy, which makes us, is just a summary of all this, um, which is, um, again, starts off by talking about the ability to put masks back on, but it says we will be a face um, covering optional district. And again, the recommended for those who are immune compromised or unvaccinated. Um, and if you are vaccinated, you're not required to wear a mask, but may do so if desired. And so, um, and then the changes to the current face covering policy, should it be enacted, it just cleaned up some of the language a little bit um, as well. So that we still have that in place where we can immediately go to that should um, things change um, course in our district. Um, so I am going to jump back to the meeting here for you. So I wanted to put something where we, when we started this, we knew this was coming. I wanted to put something out in front of the school committee to discuss. Um, Meg Birch and I and put this together and then ran it by administration as well for their thoughts um, and the nurses for their thoughts. So it's kind of coming from the school, um, but it's a kind of meganized kind of um, recommendation for change in policy. So um, I guess what I'm saying is I'm looking for you to um, you know, look at this policy this evening and, and adopt it moving forward. Are we voting by committees, Darius, or by? Yes, correct. Each each committee is its own. It's your it's your own policy, so it's not a full committee vote. You'd be going by by town and then by region, so the four towns and then the regional school. Yeah. Um, I also asked Carolyn Ness to be here tonight because I have been in contact with her regarding this, and um, she's been in contact with the local boards of health uh, as well. So if you at some point give her an opportunity to talk, since we we, we put masks on, we were working closely with the board of health, and I've been in consultation with them. Um, toward removing them. So that was going to be my next statement was, uh, Carolyn, would you care to, to fill us in on where okay. your thing stands at this point in time? <laughs> well, um, the goal has always been to keep the schools open. Um, as Darius said, we've used measured re uh, approach and database decision-making the entire time. Our school system, Union 38, was one of the first schools to open and has remained open and has had success in um, having no school transmission or minimal school transmission for the most part. So um, we, as a Board of Health, the Deerfield Board of Health, voted this morning to um, support uh, Darius's recommendation of lifting the mask mandate on March 14th. It's conservative in the sense that, um, you know, people were on vacation, so they were traveling. They could have been exposed to um, different variants. They're gonna get sick. Hopefully they'll stay home. Whoever they get sick, they'll have an opportunity to stay home. And so the 14th is reasonable in our minds. Um, as far as I know, or what we know, in the last two years is that we cannot predict 
any trends in any reliable way whatsoever. But we can monitor and track the trends, and that's what we've been doing. We, we daily check hospitalizations, um, increases in any of our case numbers or local clusters. I'm in constant communication with Darius and Meg Birch on uh, school of cases and absences, and we monitor the vaccination rates. Um, we are in the position now where we're transitioning from a full-blown pandemic to an endemic kind of situation. So it's low level occurring and we need to move on. But that doesn't mean that we aren't going to be aware. And that's why we're supporting uh, Darius's proposed um, policy. Like I said, we're in constant communication, but having Darius have the ability to act quickly is key. We might not have a quorum to get an emergency meeting together. I mean, certainly we have been acting um, on any information constantly, but you know, we do support what he is proposing. Um, we are doing everything we can to promote vaccine vaccinations because it's clear vaccination remains the most effective protection against any serious illness, hospitalizations, and deaths. So we are going to propose um, have more clinics in May, which is five months out from our past clinics. And um, again, in August before school starts so that everybody has an opportunity and hopefully the under fives will be um, able to have it. Uh, we are uh, have local PCR testing Monday, Wednesday, Friday at the um, Deerfield Senior Center or South County Senior Center from 10 to 1 so people can have confirmation. We're doing everything we can with educational outreach so that people can understand, you know, how to, how to manage um, this new transition. Conway uh, Board of Health voted to support this on Monday, as did Sunderland, and Waitley did yesterday. So all four boards of health are behind this policy. I don't know if you have any questions. I'll be glad to ask, answer any questions. I, I think I see. Is that a hand from Missy? It is. And Elaine. <laughs> Go ahead, Missy, first, and then Elaine. Sure. Uh, there is uh, one of the things that we, um, that I had some concerns about in this policy is that right now, um, Right now, as it stands, it's just should it be necessary due to increased COVID case numbers? Is there any sort of metric, uh, Carolyn, that you might suggest to help to guide that a little bit so that this isn't, you know, one way or the other that, you know, there's two cases and so everything goes back on or there's, you know, hey, well, you case numbers, you, usually there's a lag in hospitalizations. You have to get sick first and then you get hospitalized, and then it moves on, whatever, you either get out or you don't. But um, the, having the number of cases and the number of absences is probably still clearly the most current data that you can use. And, you know, I feel like our communication with Darius is, um, you know, we just have developed a good way to do this. So I, I feel if Darius notifies us, we can certainly have an emergency meeting and do this as local boards of health. But it is reassuring to me that if just happens, Dave and Trevor on vacation, you know, and we don't have a quorum, that Darius has the ability to do this. So I, I, I understand people's concern about metrics, but after two years, it's like you kind of know if we are, we're developing a serious situation. And right. yeah, cases, cases seem to be the most clearest. So, I certainly get that. And there are things that um, I see clinically that I say, I can't really explain it, but I'll tell you, I know it when I see it. And I'm sure that you have that sensation about these numbers and where things move. But I'm wondering for the parents and the staff members who may not have that intimate relationship with the numbers, having some sort of insight into how that decision is made may be helpful for them. 
so I mean, I, I can try to comment on that, Carolyn, if you want, in the sense yeah, of how yeah, okay. did that. So when we have cases right now in the school, um, you know, Meg Birch is, you know, contacted by the school nurse. They discuss, you know, where did the case come from? Is there Was there contact in the classrooms? Was there transmission, probable transmission in the classroom? I mean, those are the kind of information that we have, how many students are affected. So when we're talking about metrics and we talk, Meg and I did talk about that, and Meg, you can jump on um, at any time. Um, it's hard to come up with a metric that is applies to all situations and, all, and, in, and in multiple levels. And, you know, people don't like the CDC metrics. People don't, you know, we, with the metrics that we did before, I remember when we were in Sunderland, Sunderland turned red. And we're like, oh, no, don't worry about that. Those are the college kids. And it was, you know what I mean? And then, you know, so those kind of things where we have metrics and then you have to do yeah, but to metrics, then, you know, those kind of things. So I don't want to say if three cases are in a classroom, we're masking the class or masking the school because it's all about, we have three cases in the classroom and they're all at the same house over the weekend. That's very different than, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and we found it on Monday, you know, that it can be very different. So I think we have to apply the knowledge we have with working with the virus to each each time um, the situation comes up um, and, and whether and how we mask as well. So we mask level, just a grade level based on that, you know, the smaller school where, you know, that kind of thing is happening or is it full blown, you know, we have um, this concern of a variant or that kind of stuff and we have to go you know, full board on that. So it's really to have that flexibility. Mm -hmm. Just one, I just one like to, yeah, I just would like to add to Darius is that we have not ever shifted how we do contact tracing. We, we find out where that case originated as best as we can. Um, and we, we still continue to do that. Um, I think that's what's necessary to keep a, you know, a finger on the pulse of where exactly is this coming from and how widespread is it in the community? Okay. And Elaine, I think you had a question? Or well, it's more up. a comment. I mean, I feel okay. like um, all along we've followed boards of health recommendation. Uh, hopefully everybody realizes that how much thought and consideration and Planning goes into, for instance, this policy. It's not, you know, I mean, I actually had a little trouble with Desi's uh, decision to do it the day people got back from school break. I'm like, did they not realize where February break is? Um, I'm actually very happy for masks to come off, but I do think after a big uh, potential spread uh, event. I think it's a very wise decision to pick the dates you have. And as soon as we're ready, I'm happy to make a motion to move this forward because, um, you know, we're no, no amount of discussion is going to have people's very varied viewpoints all be satisfied. And it hasn't through this whole pandemic. Um, but we've always done the best we can to take care of our staff and our kids in the school and provide them the best education we can coping with the circumstances. And so, you know, I think we continue to follow that board of health recommendation, well put together policy. Let's move it forward. Okay. Thank you, Elaine. Um, Erica has a hand up. Erica Jacob from Deerfield. Do you have a question for Carolyn or? Sorry, I missed which button to press. Um, always, I don't know, two years, I still can't get used to it. Um, I, I suppose one of my questions, my question was um, in regard, uh, I suppose uh, maybe this is a hypothetical, but I'm just sort of wanting to know how, um, I'm thinking about the preschool um, or the preschools and just wondering how, if there's anything that would be specific to, and maybe not just the preschool, but also um, for students and faculty. I mean, we heard some of this and some of the comments, there were definitely comments in the things we read about where people were concerned about um, the folks in our community who, who may have more serious um, cons, you know, concerns that, co that catching COVID might 
bringing about more severe reactions and the idea of, I mean, one person re made, referred to the term of one-way masking that, um, you know, some people were saying that they feel more comfortable, you know, and it's even been, you know, it's, it's hard to follow sometimes all of the recommendations and regulations, even the CDC's website seems to have differing statements on the same issues and you have to look at what time they were written and stuff like that but um but the sense of you know double masking being helpful that it's still useful to wear masks when um if you are under that risk and i mean i get that it would be the choice of people to wear a mask and that that would be supported. But I'm just wondering, um, you know, our vaccination rates, I, I suppose in general, I'm wondering like, what are the steps that are going to be, um, you know, do we have, I, I, I did read the proposal, but I was just wondering like, if, if there are ways we can re send reassurance through specific means that we are helping, um, uh, you know, how we're dealing with the preschool who are too young to be vaccinated. You know, there's either people who can't be vaccinated or who, who, who aren't eligible. Um, and then, uh, you know, if we're removing masks, uh, if, if people are wearing, are not vaccinated and not wearing masks, you know, how do we um, sort of, you know, mitigate? It feels to me in some cases, like we remove the masks and then we, are um, that we should replace that with something to um, uh, balance that in terms of keeping the level, you know, as, as others have said, we, we want to be a safe, a safe community. So, okay, if we go no masks, what's, what's the balance? I mean, I don't feel like, yes, we're approaching endemic, but we don't have a stable, it feels like we don't have stable numbers which is, you know, there's two definitions of, of endemic and the endemic of, of, of equilibrium is not there yet. So how do we, you know, I hope well, masks are going to be voluntary. So it's not that people right. don't, aren't going to be wearing them if they want to be wearing them. So that's right. going to be optional. And out in the world, outside of the schools, Mask mandates are already lifted, already gone. Sure, and, but and the other thing is, so part yeah. of it is you're also able to choose whether to go to those places or not. And kids who are in school, that's where they need to be during those those towers. They don't have that choice to leave it. So yes, everyone is making True. you know. Um, so anyway, but just more to the point of of Carolyn or Darius, if you can tell well, me more um, about well, that. Well, yeah. Meg Could we? Yeah. yeah, we've got Meg. Meg Birch has her hand okay. raised. Sure. Maybe she has something to say. Just go ahead. Yeah. So I, I think there's a, there's a couple of things I want to respond to. Um, one, you know, I, I appreciate that there's a fair. You know, we early on in the pandemic, the messaging um, was really focused on, you know, my mask protects you, your mask protects me. Um, at the time, we were we were wearing cloth masks. We were wearing the disposable surgical masks. Um, there's a lot more options available now. Uh, we also didn't have vaccine for those um, for 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 most of of um, our community members. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I keep hearing in the statewide calls is, you know, we're really in a different place in this pandemic, and we're certainly approaching endemic. Um, the public health response has really shifted to one of responding to this as an endemic disease and not, it's not an emergency anymore. And that doesn't mean that um, we can totally relax, but it does mean that how we respond um, and what kinds of approaches we, we take are, are different. Um, I'm, I'm curious about you know, and I've heard this in a couple different ways over the last days. What happens in the school doesn't drive what happens in the community. If that were the case, we would have had low numbers throughout the pandemic. Um, when we see, when we get cases in the school, 
they are largely from from exposures in the community. Um, can we say there's been absolutely no transmission in school at this point? You know, with January and Omicron and the number, the sheer number of cases, I don't think we could we could say with certainty there was not in uh, in school transmission. And there's a a fairly small number of, of instances where we we kind of went, yeah, that's that we have to you know um, uh, c- consider that that's what happened. Um, so I, I just I think that 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 was one of the that was just one of the pieces that I wanted to respond to um, and. Um, I think that's it. Okay. Thank you, Meg. Carolyn, your hand is up again. I, I, I just want to just emphasize again to Erica, because I, I, I know people are concerned that it seems like we're backing off, which is not true, but um, regional case counts and, um, you know, we're, we're constantly in, on top of that. And, and what's happening in the eastern part of the state, which sort of impacts us. Um, you know, we have, we're influenced by travel. So obviously with a number of schools and, um, you know, uh, colleges and, and prep schools in our valley, then in fact, we have more exposure sometimes. But because those institutions are on top of it as well, um, we ha- are, are able to get statistics faster and data faster than what would normally happen in our more rural area. So, um, and I think after two years of, you know, talking together um, with, you know, my peer, different peers from um, other boards of health in up and down the valley and during Homeland Security um, meetings and, and, and again with uh, the wonderful relationship we've been able to work with uh, Darius and Meg that I feel like we are on top of it. I, uh, I am not backing off. I, my goal still is to keep the school open and as safe as possible. And I feel very proud that I think we've done all our boards of health have been committed through this whole pandemic, um, all four towns. And we aren't changing what we're doing. We're just saying we are in a period of transition we are transitioning to a less crisis mode. And I think we can do it, but that doesn't mean that I wouldn't be calling Darius, you know, next week at the end of next week and saying, look, we need to postpone this um, for another week or another two weeks, or we're gonna, you know, go ahead with this. And then at the end of March, something changes or at the end of April vacation, who knows what's gonna happen. Um, There is a variant, Different variants are coming down the pipe. There's no question about that. But I feel like we can be on top of it and we can adjust. And that's why I'm very um, hopeful that you will support having Darius have some ability to respond quickly. Um, we can, and we have responded quickly as for health, but having Darius using his experience for the last two years I think it will be to all our advantages to keep the school safer. And I know it's hard to say that it's not hard metrics, but I again have confidence in his ability to say, uh oh, maybe we need to take a step back and, and do this right now or whatever. I, I feel that his he has good judgment and we need to trust his judgment and his relationship with us as boards of health. If I can just um, hey, thank you. Uh, just, hey. one, just one second. Okay. Uh, Missy has had her hand up for a while. I, I don't know if it's from before or it, it's just an, no, another just, go around. So. I just put it up, but Erica, if you have something to tail off of what Carolyn said, go right ahead. Well, if I if I may, and that is what I, I just wanted to, <laughs> I just wanted to sort of follow up on her comment to me about, you know, I don't, I don't not trust <laughs> your judgment and your abilities to act quickly, and I'm glad for that. Um, I my concern was really just the idea of of how do we, um, I suppose you know perhaps perhaps it's a I feel like if I'm tapping into what I'm hearing from people who are perhaps worried about their students or their fa- or related family members who could. Um, you know, it's just like, um, like, I just don't want to put them in a position of being 
the ones who have to get COVID and suffer it because we've lifted the masks and then they are now more easily exposed. And then it's, um, you know, I mean, I, su I suppose we ask, we are all at risk at every moment, you know, it's not, you know, what nothing is foolproof, but I just, um, you know, I, it, I guess I'm also just sort of wondering like why right now and not later, I'm not, I, I want to get rid of masks eventually. I just, I, I suppose my own reaction is just, I'm feeling like I, I don't, uh, I don't I don't get, and maybe it's a communication thing. I just don't get why now. Um, so I think that the plan looks, you know, great, but, or, you know, has this, has the right parts to it. I just, it's maybe just for me, the timing. Um, but I, I will, I think I've said my piece. Okay. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Erica. All right, Missy. Um, and I also see a Jared Campbell has raised his hand at this point in time. We're just dealing with school committee members, Jared. Um, Jared is. So Jared's a school committee. Jared is. Okay. I was looking, I was scrambling around here trying to find his name. Conway. Hey, sorry about that, Jared. <laughs> Welcome, Jared. Okay. So we'll just from Conway. And then Jared. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I was scrambling through my list and I missed his name. Sorry, Jared. <laughs> Ahead, I, wanted, I wanted a little bit of clarification in that it, it looks like uh, in some of these revisions that the at the elementary level, parent requests for children to be masked will be supported. Will that not be supported at the middle and high school level? It's supported, but we can't, we will not be able to track because students in the middle and high school have, um, you know, six to eight different teachers to have, if I have Joe, um, going from class to class to monitor a list from classroom to classroom to enforce a masking mandate um, that a parent's wishes at that age level is not is not a reasonable expectation to put on the school or the teachers. So in a single classroom at the elementary, we can have who they are. We can say, you know, we've been, we can we can monitor that, and it's also there also at a, an older um, age as well. So that's kind of that's where I'm proposing forward because it's not realistic that a teacher. Um, it will be a complete distraction to say, I'm going to pull up a list. I teach 110 students, and I'm going to make sure that these 50 students are wearing their masks, and these 50 students don't have to wear their masks. It's not a reasonable enforcement. If people want to choose to wear a mask, and at the, at the middle and secondary... Understand the damn science. Yeah, I don't need that, that support. Thank you. Um, and so... Um, what I'm, you know, so what I'm trying to say is that at the secondary level, that they, it's going to be, the, it's going to be on the child, and and that the parents need to communicate with their kids and have that family decision be supported there. So we're not going to be enforcing 16 year olds to be wearing masks if their parents want the mask and they don't want to wear masks. But also 13 year olds. Yep. Yeah. Also 13 year olds. I have a 13 year old. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. I, I get so, that. Um, yeah, I, I get it. But it's what's realistic. I'm not going to say we're going to do it. A child comes to school and we don't do it. It's just not realistic when they travel that many things, and it would be an unfair burden on the teachers. And I have to make sure our policies are um, reasonable to the teachers as well. We're not trying to make things more burdensome. Okay, Jared, then Denise. Yeah, and no, I just want to echo something Elaine said earlier. You know, we're, we're not going to be able to make everyone happy. You know, there's going to be differing sides, but what we have done all along is follow the guidelines. You know, you know, we're not going to be able to make everyone happy. And it, I just think trying to do that is we're not we're it's going to be crippling. So, you know, Eric, I can appreciate your thoughts around, you know, respecting people's viewpoints and what they've shared tonight. And and I listened, I read every comment, and I appreciate everything that everyone had to say. But we're just never going to be able to satisfy everyone. Um, so, I think that's just I don't, it'd be crippling if we did. So, that's all I wanted to say. And Nice. Yes, I just wanted clarification with the K through six in that um, the teachers aren't enforcing the use of masks for the parents that, you know, want their children to use masks, correct? They're recommending it. I just, based on what you said, I want to make sure I understood. They're not going to, they're not going to discipline for that. Okay. So your child, you know, if a student is not wearing their mask, they're going to work with the, let the parents know that we're having difficulty where, you know, Joe wearing his mask in class. Apologize to any Joes out there. I'm just using your name. Um, and, 
um, working with the parents, but we're not going to be disciplining students um, and adding that extra task on teachers if there's a complete defiance of mask. You know, we'll contact the parents and work with the parents on that. But it's not, you know, you have a lunch detention, uh, you know, within the elementary, you have a lunch detention because you weren't wearing your mask properly, where your child next to you doesn't have to wear a mask at all. So that's the kind of mentality we're supporting, um, um, but not not disciplining on that. And and, and then, you know, if, if there is that disconnect, I can see the parents coming in, sitting down, and we figure out some sort of um, behavior plan that we can try to work with it, but it's not going to be a, an, an every moment onus on the teacher to enforce. Okay, thank you. Mm, Phil Cantor, then Olivia. I think Olivia. I think Olivia had hers up first. Either way. <laughs> Olivia, go ahead. <clears throat> sure. I was just, um, and I know I'm on Frontier, and so I'm not like even voting for what the elementary schools do, but um, my, I'm just wondering, so with the K through six, the teachers will now, this is an added thing that they're going to need to do is to remind kids to or not and to explain to the kids, like, why some can and some can't, like, at, at seven years old. I don't know. It, it, I'm not sure if I, I believe that's a stretch. I think kids understand that there's going to be a choice around masks. They enter yes. their buildings right now. We're going into a supermarket. You go into Greenfield right now. Are you a family that wear your mask in the Greenfield supermarket or are you not? And so they're going to, those conversations are already happening at the, the family level. And to say, you know what, we're, you know, Joey, we're going to be wearing our masks in school for a while. And then, you know, as a family, we might decide to take it off in April or whatever the case may be. And that's where it'll be. The teachers will be notified to support that. Um, right now, they're enforcing the fact that the masks have to be on. I don't think it's, you know, they're not, you know, at the elementary level, you're dealing with, you know, class sizes of, you know, 15 to 22 for the most part. Um, a couple may be a little bit above that, but, you know, a lot of them are very small sizes. I think it's a reasonable request and also to support the families that, um, you would like the children to still save masks. I, I was trying to find a happy medium in there with that. Um, the idea was not to put people all on their own. We want to support the families there, but at the same time, it's not, it can't be a battle that the school takes on alone either. And so that was the reason, and I'm just telling you the logic, that was the logic behind um, why that was written that way. Yeah, I absolutely agree that it's, you know, the family's decision and, and all of that. I just, we've put so much on our teachers and there's been so many added things to do because of COVID and all of that, that to now monitor who does and who, who doesn't. I mean, I don't know. I don't have a classroom of 18. I was just, you know, it just, you I, know, I just it, I'm open to, if it becomes an issue to talk with the teachers and you know, the principals and, and try to come a better system, but this is what we could come up with where we want it to be a partnership with families on it, not on the school alone. Okay. Phil. Yeah, just as, as to Frontier and as to Conway Grammar School, I'd like to um, make a motion to adopt the mask optional policy take to take effect March 14th. I will second that for Conway, and I'd like to proceed with a roll call vote for Conway since we're all right here. Okay. I'll second it. And I'll just, second okay, it for guys, stop. Stop. Okay. Please, just for 30 seconds. You're all in different places. Okay. Thank you. Judy, two more minutes, guys. So you got to go slow so Judy can take care of all the minutes for all the committees. So Phil and made a motion for yeah, Frontier and, yeah. and for Conway. I yep, second it. Thank you, Elaine. Point of order, Bob. Yep. Hold on. Yes. I'm we have a motion. Right hold on. We have a motion. Yep. We have a motion and a second from Conway. Elementary school. We have a motion from Frontier, but let's let's take care of people's hands who are still up because we're still in the we're still in that stage. Correct, Ken? Conway's ready. Um, I'd like to recognize Missy and Maureen. Yes, I I understand Conway's ready, but let's let's just give two additional members an opportunity to speak, and then we can move on to the Conway and Frontier motions that are on the table right now. Um, like so, that. Uh, um, it says here, mine says Maureen first. <laughs> so. Go ahead. Maureen uh, Nichols. Yep, thank you. The uh, the change, the proposed changes to the mask policy, it says zero tolerance of negative behaviors related to mask wearing. 
will not be tolerated. And I was wondering how how that was going to be enforced or who was going to do it, who's going to be doing that. Because it, it'll happen. The, the final draft, they said, they changed the language slightly on that, but basically oh. because zero tolerance has a, has a negative uh, connotation with that with, within school discipline um, from years past where you had a, a no tolerance policy, which basically meant um, absolute, you know, kind of discipline. Um, but the idea behind that is that we are going to be actively supporting, you know, um, students and classroom teachers um, to you know, promote the acceptance of all students, whether they're wearing a mask or not. And I think for the most part, I don't, I don't predict a problem in that area. I mean, kids have been very, and I'm, I'm seeing this through the lens of my kids as well, are very supportive of one another, even when they have COVID, even when they have COVID and fear that they gave it to each other, um, just talking about supportive, mm -hmm. like, don't worry about it, we're in this together, that kind of stuff. So, um, but I do want to put out there because there is the fear that if my child has to wear a mask and the child sitting next to him is not wearing a mask, that they will be teased or that kind of stuff. And basically, we're not going to, you know, we're going to be asking um, all faculty and staff to be not, not, not allow any of that and address it immediately as we would handle any type of um, uh, problem of that nature. So that's kind of where the language is there. I wanted to reassure families that choice is going to be supported um, throughout the school. Okay, and we have Missy. And just like a point of or order as to whether or not I can propose an amendment prior to the vote. Uh, if you have a motion on the floor, you can then propose an amendment which is uh, your <laughs> frontier. See if I can mess this up again. It's your frontier. frontier. So, and Frontier hasn't been seconded yet, right? Right. It was by Damien. Oh, it was by Damien? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so you can, you can propose an amendment. You can, you can make a, an amendment motion and see if it's seconded. Yes. I'd like to make a motion. I, mean, I'm not, I don't mean to speak for the chairman of the Frontier Committee, but that would be the next step. Go ahead, Missy. Like yeah, that's, I'd like to make an emotion, a motion to put forth an amendment uh, to the, the in the recommended timeline. Sorry, Judy, I, I'm going to try to work this out for you. I'm going to just as you talk. Go ahead. To strike the current wording and add mask mandate removed effective April 25th or when the population of the schools reach fully vaccinated rate of 80% and mass optional in school unless otherwise specified below. You wrote and that down, didn't you? I did. That was my hope is that you would have it there for cut and paste. Yeah. And Ken, can I say something about that prior to waiting for the second? Uh, absolutely. Go ahead. Uh, well, we should, I mean, technically, you, you need to be asking Bob, but technically, you uh, would well, wait for a second. No, bouncing back you and would, forth. You would wait for a second and then for discuss. <laughs> Go ahead. So. I just want to say that during these last two years, we have all been stressed in ways that I sincerely hope none of us will experience again in our lifetime. Nearly all of us have had shifts in how we do our jobs, how we interact with friends, family, travel, shop. Some of us have experienced illness, whether this has been physical or emotional as a result of the virus, either directly or indirectly. Some people are still experiencing symptoms despite recovering from the immediate illness. And unfortunately, others have experienced loss as this virus has caused an unprecedented death toll. We are all in a position now to make a decision we weren't trained for. And we're desperately looking for guidance and data to make sure that we make the right decision. I have no doubt that every person at this meeting, whether you sit, sit on a committee or you're here with an interest as a member of this community, I am certain that we all want our children and communities to stay safe. And even if we disagree on this issue, I just want to acknowledge that because it's so easy to get angry and upset when we disagree. And I think that we all need to keep in mind that for various reasons, we may have different opinions on this issue, 
but I know that we all care about the health and safety of our kids, our teachers, staff, our neighbors. I heard this echoed in the words from students that submitted comments in the student council poll that uh, they presented last night at our meeting, comments that were on both sides of the issue, but this spoke to that same sentiment. Unfortunately, guidance on this issue has become colored by politics, and the data is shifting as we move through various strains, vaccination rates, level of community spread, as well as adoption of mask use. I've thought long and hard about whether or not it's time to take these masks off. I've searched through graphs of cases and mm -hmm. on decisions made in other communities under different scenarios and the impact of those decisions. While the numbers and scenarios vary depending on the study, on most occasions, widespread mask use results in a decrease in transmission by about 60 to 70 percent. There are no great studies that look at the impact of one-way mask use. There are studies that compare transmission rates between communities that had more or less adoption of mask wearing and consistently the communities that had less transmission rates had more widely adopted mask use. I don't know if we're out of the woods yet. We are coming down off of the biggest spike in COVID cases during the past two years. We are not yet at a level that rivals some of the valleys we've experienced during prior summer months. We continue to have cases in our school system. Granted, they're slowing down, and last week we had multiple days for the first time in since the beginning of the year without reports of cases. Maybe that was because it was vacation. Maybe it was because we're starting to come out of this. I think in the administration's own logic in putting together this proposal, they also don't know and have included a two-week time period after break as a buffer to see if cases rise, as they often do when people have done some more traveling or interacting. So I'm... I'm not ready to make a decision now that presumes we are in a space that no one knows if we're really in. I think that time will tell and I am sincerely hopeful that we are at or near the end of this, but I think we need a little more time to see if that's true. I would propose that we keep masks on and reduce possible transmission by 60 to 70% while we look to see what plays out in the coming weeks. If we can wait until the weather gets a little warmer, then it won't just be at school that kids can be outdoors more but at home and interacting with friends, places where masks are more likely to be off and transmission is more likely to occur. Pushing the date off until the weather is warmer is a reasonable move and gives us time to see what the impact is in school systems that have decided to remove masks now. You don't have to be a healthcare provider to know that when kids go back to school in the fall, they get sick. It is likely that you have seen a reduction in the amount of illness you have experienced over the last two years. I know that in our household, we've had one illness that hit four of us in two years with three kids under 10. For any parent of even one kid under 10, you know that this is extraordinary. Do you know what the worst month is for asthma? September, the third week in September. There are factors other than kids going back to school, but certainly that is one of them. This also happened to kids that are at higher risk for complications from COVID. There have been many studies that show that children have had fewer asthma-related visits in these last two years. Flu season has been significantly less impactful in these last two years. Masks have played a role in this. Delay the removal of widespread use of masks until the next natural break in the school year, which would be April break. This allows for a more natural break and transition time for kids to prepare for this change, though I'm open to other suggestions on the date that moves us into warmer weather. In addition, I acknowledge that there's a huge benefit in terms of vaccination. So if we are at a previously DESI proposed level of 80% vaccination, I would also suggest that this is reasonable to move to a mass optional state. Though even with that being said, I'd like to point out that some school systems who achieved this rate of vaccination struggled with breakthrough cases during this last spike. So there'd be wisdom in keeping masks on regardless. I say that not as a counterpoint to my own argument, but to offer some balance that should be coming with each of these phases in this pandemic that while we move towards what we remember as normal, there's some uncertainty about what that will look like. And there are things that we have learned along the way that we may want to continue because we found that it helps to keep each other safe. Well, uh, yeah. So we got Sean yes. that wants to talk again and Phil wants to go. Phil, if if you want to move the if you want to move the move it for a school committee and elementary school, can you just wait until everybody has a chance to talk? 
I well, it's, 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 and I thought it had to be seconded before it went to discussion. But yeah, it hasn't been seconded yet. Yeah. I'll second it. A point of order, too. I think, you know, that this you just kind of got it, Erica. Hold on, hold on. So just to, on, on a point of order, I think this has got gummed up. You, you got a motion and a second for Frontier and for Conway Grammar School on the original proposal. And Conway okay, those, two, those two have to come up for a vote before you can entertain amendments to the, to, to, to the proposal at this point. The other three, the other three school committees haven't, you know, that they could go straight to an amended whatever, but Missy lacks jurisdiction or standing or whatever you want to say to make that this motion mm -hmm. in any school for any school except for the one Frontier. that she's a school committee for of. Correct. Correct. And so th this is not how you do business at a big joint school committee meeting. Like, but but um, mm -hmm. you know, this is where we're at. So. But, but the, there has to be a couple of votes first, and then if somebody is going to second Miss Eve at Frontier, then then, then there can be an amended. The, 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 then you can do an amendment to, to that. That is what I said earlier. Conway's ready to vote. We have a motion and a second, and I want a roll call. Could someone yep. explain the process we're supposed to go through, just so we're all clear? Each. Each school committee needs to vote on the proposed policy changes. And if, if in the way that I've conducted under the Roberts rules, and my understanding of Roberts rules is if there is a motion to amend, it is usually undertaken prior to the final vote on the policy. What's that? We already no. had a motion and a second. No, no, I, I know. But I'm trying to explain. Eric, Erica was asking what's going on. So right now, we have two of the school committees that have made motions to pass the, the new policy, the, the recommended policy. Uh, Conway is ready to vote. Frontier has a motion and a second um and also has someone that has proposed an amendment phil is is rightfully saying maybe that's in the wrong steps i don't know how frontier typically does it deerfield waitley and sunderland have not yet uh taken action and the int the, the intention originally was we were going to to proceed through but we have you know a couple committees that want to get moving and get things over and done with um, so that's where we're at, Erica. So we would be, Deerfield would be moving to a motion eventually on the uh, po on the policy that, that's before us. But so I'd like Conway to can move forward now with its roll call. Can I ask a follow-up question on that then? When, whenever I'm supposed really to, I don't understand what we're supposed to do. I'm sorry. We're taking a vote. We have a motion and a second on the proposed amendment. Let, let's no, let Conway, Conway finish Conway their needs, vote, Erica. Now Conway needs a roll call. So I'll do the roll call since I'm the chair. Phil, no, can no. I have your vote on the amendment? No. On, on the no. policy. <laughs> on the policy, not the amendment. The policy. The policy. The policy. Yes, on the, on the policy, yes. Okay. Jared, can I have your vote, please? Yes. Denise, can I have your vote, please? Yes. Uh, then it's just me, and I I'm, vote yes. So I'm, Connor, I'm, is, oh, I'm on the call, Elaine. Sorry, Michael, I, I didn't I see you. <laughs> Michael, can I have your vote? A yes. And I'm a yes. So Conway unanimously posted, p p passes the policy. So thank as, you. As recommended, yes. As recommended. Do we know it? Okay. Thanks, Judy. Thanks, Elaine. <laughs> <laughs> Olivia. And, and, bef and yeah, I was saying, before Frontier votes, I want Olivia, who's on our committee, to whatever she wants to talk about first. Well, well let's see. What do I want to talk about? No, um, I just, because things got a little muddled, um, I just wanted to make sure I was understanding things correctly. So, um, it's been motioned and seconded for Frontier to accept 
what Darius proposed. How, and so what I'm just wondering is, so does that mean that we're going to have a vote now with no discussion or is there opportunity for some people to bring some things to light or I don't know because I know things have to happen in a certain succession and I just want to make sure I'm not. <laughs> you shouldn't be having discussion on the amendment because it's never been seconded. Correct. Correct. But, but for first process wise, you have a first and second, you open discussion on the topic, and then at that point, an amendment can be made on that topic. So it's so, okay sorry. for Missy was process. correct to open the, you had a first and second, mm -hmm. yeah. Missy was correct in order to make the amendment at that point. So she has her amendment yeah. on the table, and if you had anything else to add, you, could, you can do that as well. Um. <laughs> but we're gonna, but we're gonna vote on the, po the new policy first, Right. And then we're going to bring up in no no no. You would vote the amended you need to, at that. Point. You're not voting you on the amendment. It's never been seconded. You would vote, vote, vote on the when it's been seconded. Correct. But I'm just doing process wise. Thank you. Okay. So we have to. <laughs> so I just I didn't know if like we everyone had already given their piece or like I just I'm I'm all for you know masking but i uh, unmasking but um i just i feel like the schools are different you know what i mean there's different needs at, at different schools um and that a high school of 13 to 18 year olds is extremely different than an elementary school and um i'm glad that we have the option um to to choose differently um it, but i also think so um Someone earlier was sharing about all of the school systems who have voted yes to lift the mask mandate, and um, most of them have listed a mask mandate, but also with other caveats. Like it wasn't just a blanket lift of, of like this. Like my concern being, um, Frontier is a wonderful building that we use for all sorts of community events, and right now all our sports teams are in are doing really great, which is great, and they're in playoff things, and those probably aren't going to happen at Frontier. But my concern would be that if between now, between the 14th and the time that we're able to like open windows and stuff, I don't really want the entire community to come into Frontier unmasked. You know, it's different when it's school and you're in school and you're with this group of people, but then to have a million people and what I've been reading at other school committees and what they've been sharing is that they've put in, a, and I don't know if this is a, has to be formally put in in a certain way, but um, that while they're lifting mask mandates for regular school school days, that large groups of people coming in for say like a basketball championship or for the musical, that those would be, you know, heavily requested to have masks on because we do have immunocompromised people who would want to come and they wouldn't be able to come in a place that would be packed in like you know, the auditorium with people all over the place. So I just, I feel like that wasn't really addressed in um, the proposal that was given, not that it wasn't wonderfully put together and doesn't have a lot of really great things in it. Um, but I just feel like the fact that we bring so many people into Frontier, um, having an, a little adjustment for that, like maybe we don't just let the entire public on the 14th walk into Frontier unmasked. That just... What I was hearing too, and what I, Patrice, the student council, she shared the information with me, is that a number of the kids, she read one of the things, but a number of the kids were concerned about missing out on their spring sports. Um, the first few weeks or their first few meets, it was a few track, yeah, people must be tracked because it said meet, but um, because of the inevitable rise of cases that might happen once you know, everyone unmixed. It's going to happen and whatever, but that those kids kids are concerned that that might be happening. And if we can keep it so there aren't big, huge groups inside the school before then, we might be able to help the kids get to where they are all outside, being able to do things for that instead of having sporting things and theater things inside. That just might be sense. <laughs> Thank you, Olivia. Master boy. Missy, did you want to? I still see your hand up, Missy. Well, I wanted to not get 
too distracted from, I think, the point of order since it's already difficult with so many committees running. But I, I think that if I understand right, we need a second on the motion that I uh, proposed before we can have any kind of ongoing discussion. Is that correct? That is correct. I think, Bob, I don't mean to be rude, but uh, Bob, maybe just a, can you just say, is there anybody going to second that? And if they're not, then let's move on because there's a lot of dead time here. Agreed. Sorry, I'm just getting tired. Yep. None, of, none of this is physically, personally tired. <laughs> and, and it would have to be firsted and second in all of the schools other than the ones that Missy sits on the school committee of. Well, well, that's the point of order for Darius. I mean, do we have to have every single committee have the exact same um, plan? Obviously, that's not, ideal, but not on the agenda. You no, know, we tried. It, this is this is new territory for us, and we've never had you know policies of this kind of thing. So you know, it's just going to be slightly different. But you can have different policies. We try to have them be the same. But in this particular case, if one committee wants to go away, that is your legal right to do so. So. So at Frontier, if if Missy's amendment is on the table, do we have a second for Missy's amendment of the policy? Would you like, would you like me to restate it? No, or Judy can Judy, you have it written down on the I'm minutes. I'm to take a little pressure off Judy. Oh, I do. I cut and paste it. Thanks, Missy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the motion presented by Melissa Novak to strike the current wording and adding mask mandate removed effective April 25th, or when the population of the schools reach a fully vaccinated rate of 80%. And after that time, masks optional in school unless specified otherwise below. Second change, add to the section on exceptions, all activities- I haven't proposed that one yet. No, she didn't do that one. Oh, that was only that one? Coming next. <laughs> Just the one. Just the one cut and paste so far. Yeah. <clears throat> so is there more Still to amend? No what did I miss? No, that is the the first proposal for the amendment. I will have another amendment after that, but still no second. If from Frontier, do we have a second on this? If we don't have a second, Missy, we're going to. What? You got to mute yourself. I'll, I'll move on to where Judy was headed and what Olivia spoke to, which is that I'd like to propose. Oh, hang on, let me pull it up. I went off a bit. Could it, could it this Eric and David will get to you in a minute. I'd like could to have an amendment to add the section to the section on exceptions and exceptions that all activities where members of the community are invited into the school, including but not limited to sporting events, plays, and musical performances as well as any large gathering of students where distancing is difficult to maintain, such as an all-school assembly. I second that. Could I, uh, could I ask you to put a end date on that? Or is it indefinite? If the, this one of those problems, if you put that in a policy. Uh, well, there's no end date on the rest of them, is there? It's because there is, it's, it's indefinite. We're going to be mask optional moving forward. So you're going to have next next September, we would be under a policy that says we can have a student assembly less than that. And so I put I'm just, if that's what you want, then that's fine. I'm just putting it out there that you'd be, you know, I mean, if it doesn't have an end date or a review date, then that carries through until it gets adjusted again in some other time. But right that's, now, the, the actual, that's, that's true with all the rest of the things that are in that exception, right? Correct. Anybody who is going into health offices uh, or people who aren't fully yeah. vaccinated to be recommended that, that that would continue to be true until we had a meeting. Yeah, but your proposal is operational. And those are, I mean, going to the nurse office is slightly operational, but, you know, um, recommendations and such is not operational. I'm just saying it, it's going to be, um, 
I'm just asking, you don't have to do it. Because I know the strain is there was a lot of concern around the musical and that they started this with a masking and the, the families are, are making that switch the same week, the performance the same week as the musical. And so I would you know, fully be behind that um, proposal if you had an end date being like spring break. You and know. then what do you have for postseason? Event. Basketball, basketball. There's a home game Friday night, and they have to wear masks because we're still a mask site. However, teams traveling to <laughs> schools who don't have mask policies are going without masks. So, you know, all this craziness out there right now. There's spring sports. Be, spring sports is only volleyball, of course. Right, and spring sports start the 21st, so they'll all be outside except volleyball. Right, they won't, they won't start until afterwards. So, again, I, I just there's. There's connection there. I understand for the musical, and not to really get decided on the musical, but if you want to throw something in there, I you know I understand that the changing the week of the play could cause a lot of people a lot of apprehension amongst the crowd and um, community coming into our building. So I, I recognize that. So I'm so sorry, Judy. Okay, fire it up. <laughs> I'd like to uh, amend, uh, make a motion to amend the amendment with an end date of April 25th, which is after spring break. For both of them, both of the exceptions. Yeah. Well, the first the first amendment didn't get seconded. It did by Olivia. Uh, yeah, no, not, she not, was, not no, the first one wasn't. The second the one, one, one was. Yeah, she was only on the second one. But I think she means both of the exceptions. Correct. To the second motion. Second, yeah, you got it. Can you give me the date again? Sorry, I was talking. April twenty fifth. April. Yeah. Thank you. So we're going to have to vote on the second amendment that we have a first and a second. She's on the date. Okay, for just to clarify, I'm going to read the motion again. Melissa Novak made a motion seconded by Olivia, Olivia Leon to amend the section on exceptions. All activities where members of the community are invited into the school, including but not limited to sporting events, plays, musical performances with an end date of April 25th. Any large gathering of students where distan distancing is difficult to maintain, such as an all school assembly with an end date of April, August, I'm sorry, April 25th. And do we still have to have discussion on this? Just a point of order. Just a point of order. That, yeah. This the is, second this amendment. Is only, this is only. Second. Hold on, hold on. This is only, uh, on, only frontier. This is only Correct. for frontier. Yeah. Unless I don't know what other school committees Missy is a member of, but there, there. This, is, this amendment frontier. has never. The, the amendment has never been moved in any other school committee besides That's frontier, correct. let alone second, let alone seconded. That's so, correct. Point so, of order. So this is strictly for frontier and only frontier. Okay. Point of order. The second yes. amendment, the amended amendment, has not been seconded yet. It, it has. Yes, it has. Yes, it was. Olivia, Olivia, Olivia seconded the amendment, but then Missy amended it again, and that second just got to go through the motion. Olivia can do it again, but then I second the amendment ending on the twenty fifth of April. So we're gonna we're gonna Frontier is gonna do a roll call on this on the second amendment. Bob Heller. No. Bill Smith. No. Keith McFarland. Uh, no. Olivia Leon. Yes. Judy Pierce. No. Damian Fosnot. No. Uh, Mary Raymond. No. Missy? Yes. Phil? No. Motion does not pass. Sorry, I didn't steal your thunder, Bob. And Missy, do you have another amendment of the policy? I don't know that. I, I don't think it's within my context to propose that something uh, stay on for the preschool. It wouldn't be applicable no. to Frontier Regional, no. So, so, so I, I, I wouldn't be able to propose that kind of amendment that something be okay. just maintained in the preschool. Well, the question for the region, Mr. Chair. Yep. So, Frontier, let's, let's vote on the new policy, please. 
Just a point of order clarification. This is not an amended policy. This is as presented by the administration. As presented. Yes, okay. ma'am. Okay. Bob. Yes. You. Carol. Yes. Keith. Yes. Olivia. No. Uh, Judy. Yes. Damien. Yes. Mary. Yes. Missy. No. Phil. Yes. Motion passes. I, I, I don't know if it's appropriate at this point in time that uh, Frontier consider adjourning and and also Conway if they haven't already all left. Well, I'm still on Waitley, so I'll, I'll stay on. And I'm no, gonna I, take I would expect members that are on the other two on the other three committees would stay on while we. Would that be appropriate, Darius? Yeah, they certainly can do that. You know, that uh, I don't think anybody else was proposing amendments across the board. Got it. Do we have a second from Frontier for adjournment? I'll second about it. Thank second. you, Damien. Are we going too slow or too fast, Judy? No, nope, it's fine. Uh, Bob? Yes. Bill? Yeah. Keith? Yes. Olivia? Yep. Yeah. Judy? Yes. Yeah. Damien? Yes. Uh, Mary? Yes. Missy? Yes. No? Yes. 819. Thank you, Motion Judy. For Motion for Conway to adjourn. I'll second it. If, if Elaine hasn't left already. Well, I imagine she's gone. I'm the vice chair. Oh, she's so. still here. Okay. Elaine's still there. All right. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, hold on. Let Judy get caught up here. No, I'm fine. Yeah. Elaine? You want me to do the roll call? No. no. Elaine can't. Uh, is Elaine not still on? No. She shows okay. it's still on, but she's not. That's fine. Denise? Oh. Is Denise still on? No. No. Okay, Michael? Yes. Jared? Yes. Bill? Yes. Thanks. That's a majority of the quorum, so. Yep. Very good. Thank you. Like, Judy, I'd like to make a motion for Waitley on the new policy. Yep. I second this morning. <sighs> Well, this will be a fast vote. Maureen? Yes. Bob? Yes. Okay. Does Waitley want to adjourn while they're here? Um, I'm going to stay on, but Ma yeah. I'm, I'm, go ahead, Maureen. You want to make a... Sure, I'll make a motion to adjourn at, for Waitley at 819. Bob, you want to second it? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, yes. Thanks, Bob. Maureen? Yes. Okay, great. 821. That leaves Deerfield. Deerfield and Sunderland. Yes, yeah, Sunderland. Sorry. I'm from Sunderland. I can't believe I did this the town. I would motion for Deerfield to Second. What was that, Carrie? There was a motion from Carrie, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yes, Ken. And was that Mary that seconded? Yes. And Eric and David both have hands up. So. so no, I was just trying to butt in and get a motion in at some point, but so <laughs> my hands not up anymore. Yes, this I hasn't just, been the smoothest. My apologies. Go ahead, Erica. I just wanted to. Um, I just wanted to know at what point I could make an amendment. To 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 um, 
to propose Missy's amendments to our policy? That would be now. Okay. Um, I Could propose. I, I, Sorry. Well, yeah, just one second. Maybe. Uh, no, go ahead if you want to uh, make a motion. You okay. would, you would move an amendment, or you could move both of the you know whatever her her recommendations you want. You can move as an amendment. <laughs> okay, so I move for as an amendment the um, the first uh, the first point of the recommended timeline. Sorry, do I need to repeat what it said, or can we copy and paste the first? In the recommended timeline, so, recommend striking. So you're the Sorry. Go ahead. Okay, so I have. You're making a. Go ahead. Go ahead, Go ahead Judy. Uh, Erica Jacob made a motion to amend the proposed policy as follows. Number one, strike the current wording and adding mask mandate removed effective April 25th or when the population of the schools reach a fully vaccinated rate of 80%. And after that time, masks optional in schools unless specified otherwise below. Right. And then I would also include the second, um, uh, the Under second and third. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yep. I'll read those two. So everybody's crystal clear on them. Hold on. I'm just copying a few things. Uh, to amend the section on exceptions. All activities where members of the community are invited into the school, including but not limited to sporting events, plays, musical performances. This exception will have an end date of April 25th. Any large gathering of students where distancing is difficult to maintain, such as an all-school assembly, this exception will have an end date of April 25th. And, and I believe, and Judy, the was a third. beginning of that whole thing should read, masks must be worn for all activities. Um, yes. The, uh, sorry, I'm just scroll, trying to scroll up to look at that. Um, mask, uh, yes, mask man, masks would be worn and then removed effective April 25th. Or, um, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, and then the third, the third one was, uh, I would also like to, uh, to, I guess, Continue the mask mandate for the preschools and all staff and students in contact with them until such time as they're able to have the choice to be fully vaccinated. Judy, I think that might get put under protocol if, if you were doing that. But, so we, we have a motion to amend. Do we have a second? I am not hearing a second, so the motion to amend has not come up for consideration. So we're back to voting on the full policy as initially recommended by the administration. So we have a motion to approve um, the mask mandate transition as proposed. Ken? Take, yes. Erica? No. David? Yes. yes. Mary? Mary? Yes. Carrie? Carrie? Yes. And the motion carries four to one. Do we have anyone that wants to make a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn just so we're done. And just want to stay they can, but at least we're adjourned. Yeah. I'm Second. And that was Carrie. Second. Yes. Sorry. Roll call vote. Ken. Yes. Carol. Yes. Yes. David. Yes. yes, and thank you, Judy, for everything. For everything. <laughs> yes, thank yes. you, Judy. Uh, Mary. Yes. And Carrie is last one. Yes, and thank you. Great. You're welcome. Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you, thank you dear field committee. Sunderland. I think everyone's a dream, but Sunderland. So that's that's, that's right. our meeting now. And I see Keith's hand is up. This wasn't imp intentional. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd like to make a motion to accept the uh, mass mandate transition as proposed by the administration. So moved. Can I get a second? 
Second. Second. Point, point, of order, point of order, Mr. Chair. Yes. Since we are changing a policy, uh, should we not be waiving the first and second reading? Not a bad idea. So I would. Can I make a? Ooh. Can I ask Keith to make a friendly restatement of his, and uh, or should I offer an amendment to that effect? Sounds like Keith's up for it. Yes. Uh, make a motion to accept the uh, mask mandate transition as proposed by the administration. We can waive the first and second reading. So moved. And, and, I, and I will second that. Okay. We got a waiver and we got the motions recommended. Do we have any discussion? Jessica. We were asked by a few preschool parents to consider a carve out for preschool until such time as preschoolers are able are eligible for uh, vaccination. I'd like to propose an amendment that the mask mandate continue for the preschools and all staff and students who are in contact with them until such time that they are able to have a choice to be fully vaccinated. Judy, that's the language from Missy's. Uh -huh. Do we have a second? All right. Um, in that case, any more discussion? Or go ahead. Yeah, Peter, go ahead. Um, I would just like to say that uh, I continue to be impressed by the efforts of the administration and the boards of health to uh, work through these continually different situations uh, with, the, with a tremendous amount of intelligence and um, good judgment. And it is that track record of doing that that is the main reason that I am supporting this proposal. Thank you. Roll call vote, Greg? <laughs> yes. Yes. Keith? Yes. Megan? Yes. Peter? Yes. Jessica? No. Mr. Chair, I move that we adjourn. So moved. I guess second. Second. All right. Peter? Yes. Megan? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Keith? Yes. Greg? Yes. Thank you all. Thank you, Greg. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.